This video might go through some heavy places, so if you're sensitive to anything that's on the screen currently, you might want to click off and watch another video. If not, enjoy. If you've been on the political side of the internet for really any time at all, you'll probably have heard a few claims that victimhood culture is going to destroy our civilization as we know it. At first brush, this seems like sensationalist nonsense, and it is, but there seems to be some merit to it. Nowadays, especially with the rise of the internet, people seem obsessed with being seen as or seeing others as a victim. Everybody's offended over everything, canceling personalities over their smallest of discretions, crying over something as simple as having black cups over white ones, or saying happy holidays rather than merry Christmas. It seems like everybody's devolved into whiny little poo-poo babies who cry whenever they don't get their way. And though I think that's an obvious exaggeration, I don't really disagree with you on that. But victimhood culture is not just something that comes up whenever someone insists you're racist because you didn't give them extra fries with their nuggets. It's used to combat huge movements like the LGBT plus movements, feminists, Black Lives Matter, and any other movement bigots feel aren't legitimate. Why is victimhood culture being weaponized against the left when people on the opposite end seem to blow things out of proportion way more than we do? Is there some things that fall under victimhood culture and some that don't? If so, what are they? <laughs> yaddy yaddy does it. Did you fall for my trickery? Did my questions lure you into a false sense of security? You fool! You absolute buffoon! In case you're wondering, <laughs> yes, I am definitely a weeb. In this video, I want to make one thing clear. Victimhood culture does not exist. I want to clear up any misunderstandings about victimhood culture while building a hopefully solid case against it. We shouldn't be engaging with this idea like it's even remotely making a point. But if you think it does, I humbly ask you to hear me out. Even if I don't convince you, maybe it'll get you to think about the way you engage with our opposition just a little bit more. So in order for me to build a case against it, we must first fully understand what victimhood culture really is. Victimhood culture is not simply the idea that we as a people are starting to be offended over every little thing. It is specifically talking about the ideas people value in said culture and what they will do to uphold said values. To start with, in cultural psychology, there are generally three cultural logics. That would be honor culture, dignity culture, and face culture. But for the sake of saving time, I'm only going to talk about the first two. In honor culture, a person, usually a man, protects his reputation by violence or threat of. These cultures often develop in lawless environments where there's no authority to keep their people safe. It's often seen by people under honor culture as a way to establish a sort of dominance. If they respond violently to something as small as an insult, then people will know not to mess with them when it comes to larger issues. As you might have guessed, a culture of honor is often tied with masculinity, which can quickly turn toxic. In honor culture, your worth is tied heavily with your reputation. If you let anything slide, your honor could be ruined. Hence why a lot of these people tend to feel very angry whenever they're slighted. Dignity culture, or guilt culture as it's sometimes called, unlike honor culture, is more reliant on the individual. Where honor culture says a person's value comes from their reputation, dignity culture says that everybody has their own inherent worth. Ideally, the people within this culture stick to their own principles as they are less swayed by other people's opinions. Rather than anger, the motivating emotion in dignity culture is guilt, as when you don't stick by your own principles, you'll develop a guilty conscience. Though this culture has obvious advantages over honor culture, it can be easily exploited by those without a guilty conscience, and if there are laws that come in conflict with your own inner principles, it can leave you between a rock and a hard place. Well, I, I suppose those are relatively minor flaws in beating the shit out of anybody who calls you a dude wet. Now, back in the day, say like around 2014, 2015, the term microaggression was invented. What? The term microaggression was invented how many years ago? 50? Then why are people acting like it was just invented five years ago? Despite how it may seem, the term microaggression was coined in 1970 by psychiatrist and Harvard University professor Chester M. Pierce, that liberal scum. He used it to describe small verbal behavioral and environmental indignities that are used to communicate a negative prejudicial insult. For example, you sound so smart for a black guy. Microaggressions are usually targeted towards marginalized groups, and though there's not enough evidence to say that it has some type of long-lasting psychological effect on those that are affected by it, it's still a kind of shitty thing to do. Around 2014, this term started making a resurgence. As schools, campuses, and workplaces attempted to bring in more diverse populations, the general public started to get more conscious about the way they interact with marginalized people. 
Though as far as I can tell, training for such didn't begin until a couple of years later, it was apparently enough to tingle the brain cells of sociologists Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning to write a paper titled Microaggressions in Moral Cultures, which would then be adapted and expounded upon four years later into the book The Rise of Victim and Culture. To explain the outrage and protests that were happening due to microaggressions, Campbell and Manning proposed a new cultural logic. In their scholarly paper, Campbell and Manning state that victimhood culture is an evolution of honor and dignity culture. The people in victim culture place their status as a victim above all, finding a sense of worth in their victimhood. Like in honor culture, these people tend to be sensitive to insults, but since their status relies on how oppressed they are and not on their general reputation, they don't mind appealing to a third party to help solve their problems for them. Through their exaggerated victimhood, they then mobilize third parties to act on their behalf as a way to control the social narrative. This culture is often found on college campuses where, conveniently, microaggression complaints are the most prominent. Now mind you, I took this basic summary of the paper from Jonathan Haidt's blog, The Righteous Mind, but it seems like Haidt, Campbell, and Manning are generally cool with each other, so I'm kind of just assuming that it's in the ballpark. I'll be linking everything down below though, so please call me out on my bullshit if there is any. There's a lot of problems I have with this theory. Mainly the fact that, oh my fucking god, it's so convoluted. Like, have y'all ever heard of Occam's Razor? But that's besides the point. Here's a list of issues that I have with the theory of victim and culture. The entire thing that prompted this paper and subsequent book was the supposed outrage on the use of microaggressions. But as far as I can tell, outrage just means that Campbell came across a forum with a bunch of college kids that were complaining. That hardly seems like they're calling attention to their victimhood. But to be fair to them, I still Googled protests between 2013 and 2015 that had to do with microaggressions. But every protest that I found that was supposedly about microaggressions usually we're talking about broader issues. One of the most used examples during this time was of a Yale student yelling at her professor over emails that leaked between him and his wife showing that he wasn't in support of a rule that was banning the use of offensive Halloween costumes. So things like feather headdresses, turbans, and blackface. Ah uh, yes, don't you hate it when the libs ruin your safe space by stopping you from acting out a horribly offensive cultural stereotype for Halloween? College is the place where you're supposed to be as racist as you could possibly be. There was also a lot of underlying issues that came up because of this controversy. There are talks of white students excluding non-whites from parties and public spaces, and many of the non-white students on campus said that they didn't feel welcomed on campus. This wasn't just an issue of microaggressions, it was an issue of systemic oppression that these kids felt while they were going to this college. As a black kid that lives pretty much right next to Yale, I can't really blame students for feeling this way. When I was in high school, I was part of a couple Yale programs, but every time I went on or even near campus, I would be glared at by a lot of the Yale kids that were walking by. I wouldn't really be doing anything besides walking, but these kids would literally stop in the middle of their conversations just to stare me down as I walked past. It got to the point where it was so stressful for me that I just kind of ignore places that have high concentrations of Yale students altogether. I can't imagine actually being a student there and having to deal with this every single day. And that's what I think Campbell and Manning somehow managed to overlook. Though their research was about microaggressions and why college kids were so worked up about it, they failed to actually see what microaggressions actually entail. If people are complaining about microaggressions, it's often to affect a larger issue that's going on on campus or in our world as a whole. And that brings us to our next point. In an interview with Michelle Carroll on the channel, Exploring Minds with Michelle Carroll, Campbell, who seems to be the one who likes the spotlight more, says, and Oberlin. Oberlin is a famously progressive school. So it's, um, so the students there tend to be concerned with progressive causes, um, anti-racism, and those kinds of things. And so it was kind of interesting to us as sociologists who, who study morality and moral conflict, um, why was it that, that the students there at this, incredibly progressive place, more so than in other areas of society, were so quick to think of it as a hotbed of racism, that mm -hmm. there are Klansmen around and all these racists. When doing this research, Campbell and Bradley automatically assumed that because their campuses were very liberal, that discrimination was something that was unlikely at best and ridiculous at worst. And I'd like to point out that just because a campus presents as outwardly liberal doesn't necessarily mean that discrimination is something that just can't happen on campus, especially when a lot of these colleges were built on that. 
Outside of that though, victimhood culture isn't something that's just being used to talk about behavior on college campuses anymore. It's being used to talk about our world as a whole. And that's where the glaring hole in their logic becomes more apparent. As of right now, black people are twice as likely to be unemployed, make up more of the prison population than they do in America, and are three times more likely to be killed by the police than white people are. There's a clear racial disparity here, and if you want to justify that by saying black people are just lazy criminals who deserve to be slaughtered in the streets, then I'm sorry to break it to you but you might be a little racist. There's also the fact that during the making of the script, the Supreme Court passed a law protecting sexual orientation and gender identity under the Civil Rights Act, which is fantastic, but literally just happened this past week. Up until this past week, people who are gay or trans were able to be fired or otherwise discriminated against while on the job. There are so many aspects of our culture that disadvantage marginalized groups. So saying that the people that are calling attention to this are just trying to manipulate people for control over society fails to acknowledge the bigger issue with systemic oppression that our culture actually has. Also, quick question, why would anybody want to fix any of the problems they complain about if their sense of worth comes from their victimhood? It would make more sense if people called attention to their victimhood but gave no real ways to solve the problem, thereby perpetuating their feeling of victimhood through third party support. But so many of the movements that people claim fall under victimhood culture give real ways to solve the problems that they bring up. And are you telling me that every single one of these movements started because some person wanted to deal with some small dispute by changing policy? How would changing policy even help with small disputes? I understand how maybe getting a professor fired for saying some racist joke might be controlling the social narrative, but if a law or rule were to be put in place on college campuses, that wouldn't stop people from saying discriminatory shit, it would just mean they would have to be more careful about it. Complete tangent. Let's just move on. To further add to the point that Manning and Campbell see discrimination as something that happens on only a minor scale, they talk about the idea of domination as deviance. Our society is one that condemns oppression, and since they think we've come to a point where we're relatively equal, there's been a shift in what we choose to get angry about. Because racism, sexism, xenophobia, and the like are something that's seen as deviant, it takes smaller and smaller offenses to trigger outrage. They state, the taboo has grown so strong that making racist statements, even in private, might jeopardize the careers of celebrities and the assets of businessmen. Okay, I'll throw them a bone here. I do think that discrimination is getting increasingly more deviant, but are they trying to state that there's a point where it shouldn't be considered as such? Like putting on blackface and saying death to all Jews is a little much, but if you're just sitting in your corner whispering racial slurs when no one's around, it's all good. If a racist shouts nigger and no one's around to hear it, then was he ever really racist at all? Listen, there is no point where discrimination against a marginalized group becomes acceptable. Discrimination as a whole is not a neutral thing. Though Bradley and Kim will try to make the point that mature people would just brush it off and ignore it, they're once again ignoring a larger issue here. Discrimination doesn't just stop at the sly backhanded compliments you give to some gay guy that's walking down the street. It infects the way you see yourself, the world, and other people. It makes you believe that on some level you are superior, you are untouchable, you are entitled to something that those people are not. Do you think that that way of thinking, regardless of how small the voice is, doesn't affect the way you see the world? Especially when you have money and power. So many of the celebrities and businesses whose careers were supposedly jeopardized by cancel culture go on to use their power to influence policy based off their own views. Chick-fil-A, an $11 billion company, has a long history of donating to anti-LGBT plus charities. JK Rowling has been using her huge platform to push her views through transphobic propaganda onto her teenage fans. Phil Robertson, you, you know, the dude from Duck Dynasty, teamed up with Citizens United to support a bathroom bill banning transgender people from using the bathroom of their choice, not to mention the racist, sexist, homophobe that currently runs for our entire fucking country. But let's not stop at celebrities and businessmen, because that's not where discrimination stops either. Let's address the elephant in the room, because we've already seen what happens when we allow discrimination to fester within our systems, because our entire police system was built on that. Let's talk about George Floyd. We forgot that some kids' utopias is a roof that won't whisper the night to the sleeping bodies below. We forgot that bodies sleep below. We forgot that bodies float. 
bodies hang. We forgot barbecue, postcards, strange fruit, and hooded men. I forgot my rage. On May 25th of this year, Minneapolis police officers were called on George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man on suspicion that he had paid for cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. They cuffed him and police officer Derek Chauvin pinned him to the ground, knee on the back of his neck for a total of eight minutes and 46 seconds. He cried for his mother, yelling that he could not breathe. Bystanders screamed for Chauvin to get off his neck with no avail. Even as he lost consciousness, even as the paramedics came, he refused to move his knee off the back of Floyd's neck until paramedics instructed him to, and his colleagues did nothing to stop him. I will not be showing the video here, not just because it's upsetting to watch, but out of respect for him and his family. Though this is one of the most widely known cases of police brutality simply because the entire thing was caught on video, Floyd was not even the only black person to have died at the hands of the police that month, let alone this year. On May 13th, Breonna Taylor, a 25-year-old black woman, was shot eight times in her sleep when Louisville police kicked down her door after getting a no-knock warrant for the wrong house. On May 27th, just two days after Floyd's death, 38-year-old Tony McDade, a black trans man, was shot without warning as he was suspected of a stabbing that happened a little before his death. On May 23rd, Ahmaud Aubrey, a 25-year-old black man, was shot and killed by two white residents while jogging. The police were initially told to make no arrests and did not take action until over two months later after a video of his death went viral and FBI got involved. On June 1st, David McCatty was fatally shot by Kentucky National Guard and the LMPD in front of his store during protest over the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The police on the scene had turned off their body cameras during his slaughter. Those are just some of the cases that gained traction some of the cases that were televised, but there are so many other deaths that go unspoken. So to all the names that were forgotten, I say rest in power. Police discrimination against people of color has been a reality for pretty much my entire life. My grandma always told me to be careful on the streets, to watch out for my surroundings, to never look suspicious, but I didn't really get the relationship between black people, white people, and the cops until the death of Trayvon Martin. I was 11 years old. I was watching the news with my mother and I just remember seeing his face flash on the screen. Even though I knew he was older than me, he still looked so young. And when my mother explained to me that the man who murdered him walked free. When she told me that he walked free because he claimed he was defending himself against this unarmed kid, I, I cried. Um, I mourned him. I felt so old back then that I didn't really comprehend that this happened when I was that young. You get numb to it after a while seeing your black brothers and sisters die. There is a new face every time we turned on the news. Uh, for a while, us dying at the hands of the system just kind of became an unchangeable fact of life. But something hit different with George Floyd. I'm not sure if it's just because we're in the middle of a global pandemic or if it's because I now have experience as a black man, but something in me snapped when I saw Floyd slowly suffocate under that cop's knee. I, like so many others, decided that something had to be done because we are so fucking tired. We're tired of having to fight to survive. We're tired of living in a country that constantly has knives to our neck when all we did was be black. It's baffling to me that while we fight for justice and change, there are people who honestly believe that we're making a big deal out of nothing. Like we're playing some moral game of chess and using black bodies as pawns. Do you honestly think that rather than trying to prevent more death, we're using this as an opportunity to gain some type of moral high ground? To control the social narrative or whatever? At the end of the day, those who shout victim of culture, especially at the Black Lives Matter movement right now, are deliberately trying to erase our struggles. Why? Because 
as more and more people realize the very real problems that marginalized people face, more and more racists need a way to hold on to their beliefs without feeling guilty about it. What better way to soothe a boomer's conscience than to tell them that systemic oppression doesn't exist and it's just a bunch of babies that don't know how to deal with their own disputes? But when you constantly have to jump through hoops to explain your logic, when your theory is so full of holes that it falls apart at the slightest bit of scrutiny, when your theory can be used to disregard the literal murders of people who are just trying to live their lives, and when your theory defends actual fucking Klansmen, I think it's time to go back to the drawing board. Before I close out the video, I do need to address the very real false victimization that happens whenever any marginalized people's movement starts to speak a little too loudly. Because if anything, things like straight pride, blue lives matter, all lives matter, and men's rights activism are things that would actually fall under victimhood culture. They were all put together with a specific goal, to combat movements they feel are gaining too much power to maintain control of the social narrative. It doesn't mean that there aren't genuine people who do believe in these ideologies. I do know of people who think that straight people are oppressed and that black people are going to rise up to take over all of America. But this juxtaposed pseudo movement was made specifically to mobilize white cis men against other movements. They were made to stomp out any movement that threatens their place in society. The thing is though, I don't really want to call this victimhood culture either. For one, that wouldn't really do much. Campbell and Manning touch upon counter movements within their paper for a brief moment, basically just saying, well, yeah, I started it. Victimhood culture will always start with people pointing out legitimate problems and people making up fake ones until we supposedly drown in our own victimization. But the main reason why I don't consider these a product of victimhood culture is because even though the effect is to make white cis men feel like they're victims, the movements themselves are pretty much just propaganda. It's the same fear-mongering bullshit that they said back in the day when they made legitimate videos saying that gays were after your children, or that if you gave a slice of watermelon to a black person that they willingly slay enslaved to you. Real talk. Look it up. <laughs> At the end of the day, blaming these movements on victim culture really just fails to see them for what they are. Complete and utter bullshit. If you made it this far, thank you for sticking around until the end of the video, and if you're a victim culture -er, doubly thank you for sticking around until the end of this video. Um, I, if you want to like jump in the comment section and say that I'm some like stupid kid that doesn't really know nothing, um, you can do that, uh, but please consider donating to one of the charities I'm going to have listed on the screen. Um, I'm not some big YouTuber with add revenue, but I do still want to do my part in helping. Um, so if you have the money to, please donate. If you don't, join a protest. Uh, I'll have in the description of the known protests in America, if I can find the list. Um, if you cannot join a protest and you can only post activist memes, uh, that's fine too. Someone's gotta do it. Make sure to like this video and subscribe down below if you want to hear me talk about more things that I care about. It's going to be past Juneteenth by the time I post this video, but I hope it was a wonderful holiday for all my black people and even my white people out there. I don't know. Sometimes y'all be getting lit with us. Um, this is TMG signing out. Peace.